So uh, Daniel or Dan, if you want, uh, I am a, uh, a scientist. I'm what's called a beamline scientist at the National Synchrotron Light Source 2, uh, which is at Brookhaven National Lab. It is the brightest source of light in the solar system. And we use it to study uh, things that are very, very small, things at the atomic level with very, very powerful x-rays. And how I got there is very strange and I'm still not really sure I understand it. Uh, I'm originally from, from Michigan. I, I grew up just outside Detroit um, on a farm, you know, a classic place that you start as a, as a AI scientist. And, and uh, I, I sort of got interested into to science. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I learned I was decent at math, but I couldn't memorize anything. So biology was hard for me. Um, so I went into physics and I ended up doing my bachelor's, master's and PhD in physics all at uh, Michigan State University. Um, while there, I was really on a theorist track. I, I wasn't doing any experiments and um, I was trying to save the world like you do. And, and, and so I was working on new types of solar cells, um, highly energy efficient solar cells. And it turned out that solar cells I was studying were absolutely terrible. They were just really bad. Um, but the techniques that we used to study these um, fascinated me, which were these, these um, scattering techniques they're called. And so after I finished my, my PhD, um, I sort of pursued that. I said, I want to do more of this sort of structure solving, understanding more about the nanoscale material, uh, nanoscale structure of materials. So I took what's called a postdoctoral research position at Los Alamos National Lab. So I got out of Michigan, lived down in New Mexico for a couple of years. That was interesting. Loved it out there. Grew to appreciate spicy food. Um, I moved, I took another postdoc at, at Oak Ridge National Lab. So I, I, I really got swept up into the Department of Energy's um, lab complex, which is a, a great thing we have. Um, and now I, I got a job offer up here in, in uh, out on Long Island and I work at Brookhaven National Lab. And along the way, you know, the, the way that I got into AI was the amount of data that we're making when we do these experiments is huge. You, you know, what, the people who, who, the founders of these techniques that started them 30 years ago could kind of do this stuff by hand because one measurement might take a day. Well, now we do a hundred measurements a second. So um, I've, I've come at AI kind of from this very other interesting angle of like, uh, I need this. I need these tools to do the other science that I was, was interested in. So that's kind of how I got here. And, and, and I'm so happy to have the opportunity to speak to you all today. I think that there is there is two uh, sort of very broad classes as to why um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these things get 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 useful. One of them, right, is and you can almost look at it in sort of the division of the field and why people went into it. Um, on the one hand, it's just trying to understand how we learn. I mean, there's this whole fascinating side. When when I was first getting into this, uh, I, I had uh, my first child. It was wonderful. It was amazing. And it was very interesting to compare as you look at the algorithms, like I could feed, you know, a thousand images, 10,000 images of a cat and 10,000 images of a dog to a computer. And it got okay, pretty, you know, like you iterate on this thing and, and the convolutional network so go, okay, it's a cat. And I could show it to my toddler, right? Like here's two cats and one dog. And he had it like that. Right. So there, there is a side of this that, that is sort of, um, people trying to understand how, how we learn and how our brains operate. But then there's the, the other side of it, which is, hey, this is a really useful tool. We can use this for a whole lot of different applications. Um, sometimes I think the term sounds a little intimidating. People think, oh, is it, is it the, you know, is it what science fiction says? And when I run into other scientists, and sometimes scientists are very, very skeptical of this, they go, oh, our artificial intelligence, machine learning. I go, okay, if you don't like that word, Imagine it's applied statistics to big data. It's math, at, at its core, it's math. And um, you are uh, doing, you are tricking computers into doing things for you. Um, I, I think that it, it's, uh, it's a very nice, uh, you know, application and you're finding it in all these things, right? There's, there's business reasons, there, there's things where you talk about self-driving cars, there's even things like, 
little little teeny learning patterns on, on your thermostat, right? To, to use energy more efficiently. There's stuff that we're doing at the lab, which is like, you know, can I scan through a million patterns from these, these X-ray tomographic reconstructions to, to help build more efficient batteries, right? To, to understand the fundamental properties of, of nature that are happening. But then there's also like, can it make a, a very competitive video game enemy that I'm fighting against, right? And, and that learns my moves. And, and um, so I, I see it as a tool, like it's fascinating. It's, it's a fascinating tool. Um, there is, there's a great joy in making a tool and then, and then sharpening it and making it better. And I think so that side of working with the AI is really fascinating. Um, but the application, you know, what do you do with a hammer? What do you do with a slightly better hammer? You do everything, you put up a house here. Science is, is like on a good day about 90% failure. And that's, you know, that's fine. It's all about that you learn through the failure. But what's the skill that I find that, that that's really critical um, in, the, in all the jobs I've had and uh, all the research I've done is communication and collaboration. Um, we are not islands anymore. Science used to be done by the wealthy families in their basements as a pastime. We, we can't study the nature of a candle anymore and get a publication out of it. Um, everything, I always say everything left is hard. So uh, you can't possibly grasp it as, as one person and you shouldn't try. Uh, get really good at what you're good at and then be aware of the things that you're not good at and collaborate with people. You know, we're, the discoveries that we're making, the ways we're, we're all trying to make the world better and, and really transform uh, society for, for the better and, and the world for the better, um, we can't do it alone. And so, you know, I team up with chemists, I team up with uh, a lot of brilliant uh, uh, finance people who figure out how the, the budget and the planning for how to do these big experiments. I team up with, with biologists who say we're really interested. We had one that was like studying the structure of materials inside different fish's ears because it turned out that the material inside the eardrum or whatever it is, I am not a fishologist, uh, the eardrum of the fish would, would form different minerals based on pollutions in the water. So could you use the, the, the atomic structure of the inside of a fish's ear to determine if it had come from a polluted water. You know, but, but all this work, it, it's not done by individuals. It's all about communicate and collaborate and always be, be willing to say, I don't know this. I have an idea, but it's my idea and it's a very limited, like I, I'm sort of coming at this problem from my collective experiences, but we are so much better as a team. We are so much better from a diverse set of people tackling this problem together.